down there? Yes. <laughs> Maybe I'll take off my jacket. Um, so I want to speak. I want to speak this morning about um, a few things that are really dear to my heart, but some of them come from. So you'll hear some similarities, a few things that we talked about yesterday in the Women's Federation, um, cornerstone of, of happiness for those who were there. But I chose this as my title, Loving the World Begins in My Family. Because I feel like um, it's the time now. It wasn't always the time in our, in our church movement to focus on really building up and, um, our families. We had many other missions that we had. But truly our two parents' message is that you know, the family is the, the place where uh, God can dwell. So I'm going to begin with the scripture reading. <laughs> in him, you also are being built together to a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. From Ephesians 2:22, 2, 2 verse 22. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, but also a few words from there we go. From um, our our two parents. Uh, this was given at a women's federation event. A sound, healthy family family is the school of love and virtue. Enlightened women are the center of the love, peace, and service that preserves the family. And also, we know that. Um, from our, our two father, Father Moon, that he has said a number of times that the family is the only institution created by God. This is a school of love where people can learn how to love each other, live together in peace, and it is the training place where we practice how to build, how to build a world of peace. So I've really been thinking about this a lot. I've worked as a teacher and an educator for over 25 years. And I had various um, church missions, but it's really true that um, if we did, we were meant to learn about relationships, how to really love others in our family, and as, as well as the family, every faith tradition has prayers for peace. But I think that we haven't understood until um, we didn't really get what our two parents were talking about. How the key to that peace. Is, is starting from the family. So, he, of course, in uh, Jesus' teachings, he said, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. So that means we need to love all people as, uh, as we love ourselves. Maybe part of the problem is that we don't always love ourselves, that we don't always feel that we are God's son or daughter, that we are worthy. But still, that has been um, through all of history, also, the golden rule is in almost is in every faith tradition. Um, this was when I was a kindergarten teacher. This was one of my class rules. You have to treat other people the way you want to be treated. So, learning respect and kindness. And yet, if we think about the state of the world, even right outside these walls here, you know, we're not surrounded by that. We're surrounded by um, fear and oppression and war and crimes, and dysfunction in the family, and divorce, and so many, so many things that divided, have divided our world, and really kept us from understanding this, treat other people the way you want to be treated. And it's kind of easy to think that the world's getting worse, and that, you know, maybe there's not a lot of hope. But I feel like that our time is now. And you know, to be able to bring that message to the world. There's a there's many paths for peace. There's lots of organizations through education, through diplomacy, through interfaith dialogue, through economic empowerment that that are important, but they actually you can't just legislate a law and say you have to treat people this way. It has to come from the heart. And so we need people, and this is part of Women's Federation premise, is to become peace leaders, leaders who lead from the heart. So um, 
There are many ways to develop those, those skills. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Strengthening the family and art and culture are equally important. But, but if we see that strengthening the family is only like one little part of it, we don't understand that actually that's the key, the beginning, the foundation point. So we can, if we can look at leadership skills, and we know that there are certain characteristics that are important, but what makes a good leader? Someone who um, represents, rather than telling people what to do, they do it, they do it themselves. They okay, so they provide a model to follow. Right. Yeah. Okay, what else? Am I a good leader if I just sit around and don't ever come to any conclusion? We need a plan of action, right? Right. Um, there's many characteristics. People who are loyal, who are um, honest, who are um, you know, dynamic. It's easier to follow a person who has uh, being dynamic. But, but a person who leads from the heart is um, a different level of leadership because they care about the people that they're leading, they don't ca just care about their position or their glory or their recognition. Um, also, we need, you know, like certain skill set that um, have of being a good communicator, being willing to, being able to find a win-win situation, being able to bring people together at a table, but. Um, our true mother has said that history is calling for reconciliation, compassion, love, service, and sacrifice. Today's problems cannot be solved by the logic of power. Our present problems can only be solved by the logic of love. This is one of the taglines for Women's Federation is about the logic of love, bringing in the, the heart. So, also, we know that our two, uh, that in recent set, last couple years, our two mother has exemplified this part of love. She's been the mother, she's become the mother of peace by offering <coughs> us ways to, to heal, even when she went to, to Senegal and offering prayers and, and uh, healing for the thousands of years of suffering there. And when she went to Germany, um, or to um, Europe. And also, just in her words, she's very succinctly telling us that we really have to model what we're talking about. So I think that um, it, it's actually the power of love she's showing us that melts away <coughs> the pain and is able to get people to a point of being, being able to forgive. Like in, in um, every big gathering, that has happened in Korea, you can feel um, her, her touch in all of the details that she takes care of and makes sure that people have a delicious uh, food and good accommodations and really wanting to, to take care. She can't embrace us all personally, but every person who went, whether they're part of our church or some other organization, she has um, instruct, given instructions to create an environment where you can have this, this logic of love. And this is what our world desperately needs. Many, many people have kind of a heart in the shell to, in order to survive. And underneath that shell, like many times we, we see the anger and things uh, erupt in our country and in other countries, but underneath that is the pain and the the feelings of loneliness and the hurts that has happened that people cover up because they don't know how to deal with it. So it's only actually when people can feel seen and heard and accepted that they can be able to then heal. And that's a real foundation of peace. So maybe you've heard, like whether it's in our church or with uh, at your workplace, you know, about being a leader or a, a having a position of leadership. So sometimes we think, oh, I'm not a leader. But I think that we have to think about what does it mean to lead from the heart? 
it's really the characteristics of uh, being present and caring for other people and learning to love and to care for people. That's, that's leadership in that we influence other people by being able to care about them. And I think that many times we misunderstood in the past about what witnessing was. Witnessing is caring about other people. It's one, caring about their lives and building a relationship to them. It's not just getting them to an event. And I think, you know, we had a certain mandate to do things in the past, but I think now our mandate is to understand what it is to be able to cultivate that kind of culture in our in our community, in our homes. So anyone in my circle of influence, I can I can reach out to them. I have new neighbors that just moved in next door. So when I come home, I'm gonna go over. Um, I don't know if they have any special diets. My husband said I should take them a pie. So I'll take them a pie, you know, and say hi, and welcome to the neighborhood. And reach out to them and, and find a way to connect. So that, that is like the opportunity for us to um, influence. Now we have certain characteristics of leadership that are considered more masculine style leaderships, being more assertive, decision maker, efficient, competitive. That's, that's more the traditional view that we have of leadership, and especially in the business world. And you know, one of the things I think that, that that went wrong in the whole feminist movement was that they thought that they had to compete to be on the same level of, of um, the masculine style leadership. But we also need a feminine style leadership. And actually I heard, when Dr. Gotham was the president, he told me that um, they were setting up the National Council. And he said, right now all the people that were nominated are, 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 are men. We need some women on the on the council because otherwise there's too much talking and you don't actually get to a point of decision. There's actually research that shows having one or more women on a, on a committee helps to be able to find the common ground, the point of that we can agree upon and making some decisions. So the feminine style leadership is more embracing, nurturing, collaborative, inclusive. So that's actually what we need in, in the home, we need both, of course, but in the workplace and in our movement, we need the feminine style and the masculine style leadership leading, centering upon heart, leading, centering upon the example of our true parents, and especially our true mother at this time with, you know, mother of peace. So, we can't have one without the other. If, if you think about it, um, it's, it's a definite um, difference in, I think it's inherent in how, in how we are made, our makeup, but between f uh, female and male, we both understand now, especially with having our two parents, a couple representing God, our heavenly parent, which represents the feminine and the masculine. We, we, have, we're in, we have a new era to move into. But still, practically speaking, what does that mean for all of us? So Mother Teresa said, what can you do to promote world peace? Go home and love your family. So I'm pretty sure she didn't mean only do that, but I think that's the starting place, that you know, we have to really begin in our family. And that's why I chose this, the title, Loving the World Begins in My Family. This is key. So organizations and churches and government, and nonprofits, they're all striving to find um, pathways to peace, but actually it's easiest if we begin with that, that key um, institution that God, that God created. So I'm going to just review what our true father said, that family is the only institution created by God. It is a school of love where people can learn how to practice, to love each other and to live in peace, and it is a training ground where we practice how to build a world of peace. So we are meant to learn how to relate in our families. And, and for many of us, the um, first gen, older generation, we didn't have that luxury because we were responding to the Messiah. We didn't have the opportunity 
to always invest in our family. And when we did have it, sometimes we didn't understand how to do it. Because the reality is that to drive a car, you have to get a, have to take a test and pass a, uh, take a, pass a test, you have to study. But to be a parent, to get a marriage certificate and to be a parent, there's no preparation unless you seek it out. So we need to understand that um, that we as parents did the best we could and our parents did the best they could. It's something like, that has gone through history. But if you think about it, I, I think everybody can admit, you know, that we made lots of mistakes and we want to be able to heal those mistakes. And also I think that, um, you know, we have all kinds of families and in the family is supposed to be the, the opportunity to learn respect. Yesterday we talked about the four realms of art. So that's where our children learn filial piety is, is not just because we demand it, but because we model it. We model loving relationships. We model with our spouse so then, um, and, we and we help our children um, to learn how to get along. And also, I'm coming to understand more deeply about what um, that this institution, the family is an institution. It's really, we're meant to be a dwelling place for God. So God can't experience family unless he's in our families. He can't experience the relationship between husband and wife, between parents and children, unless he's dwelling in our family. So we are meant to be um, the place for God to experience more more completely. The challenge is that we know from the fall that we have world peace will begin when we end the wars within each of us. So it's something that we still have to continue to work at ourselves. I can't be a loving person if I don't know how to love. And if I, in some senses, if I haven't received um, love, so one of the things that happened three and a half years ago, my, I was in California for 25, four years, and my husband and I moved to Georgia. And um, we moved there because of my husband's work. So I gave up a lot of my hats that I was wearing in California. I came to Georgia and I didn't have anything to do. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with myself? I, I prayed, I studied, I looked. And um, I felt like I didn't get clear answers. Yes, I only got, like, things didn't work out, so I figured out, okay, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, and it kept on going, and um, I, I found a, about Real Love, which is um, many books written by Greg Bear. How many of you have heard of Greg Bear? So, I believe that God inspired him to write these books about real love for us and everybody to understand about true love. So he takes the concept of unconditional love and he fleshes it out in real world examples. Uh, he has, there's the real love and there's real love in marriage, real love in, in parenting, real love in um, dating. It's even a practice because he believes, he's a Mormon, he believes in um, abstinence before marriage. So he's not, you know, he's not perfect, he's got, but he's, God has worked through him. I believe to help us understand more completely about how what that looks like and how to work through real love and relationships. So my husband and I went, he lives an hour and a half. Sorry, I forgot this point. He lives in Georgia. So I felt that was by that was God sending us there. He lives an hour and a half from where I live. Um, so we went to a retreat at his house and we were able to meet him and meet other people. There was actually another sister, church sister there from Seattle. And so I feel like, also I, I ran across a program called Love and Logic, and it's a parenting education course in Colorado. So I've been studying it because it's very similar in content in giving us the kind of guidance that I didn't have when I was raising my children. And I, it, 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 at the, the heart of it is, there has to be connection, there has to be relationship, there has to be love in order for us to guide and support our children, whether they're two years old or adult children. Um, so I feel like that 
in many ways, uh, in, our, in our life, we worked from, we understood the principle as head knowledge. Like we sacrificed and we worked hard, but I think we didn't always move it into the realm of the heart, of understanding what it means in relationships. And so for some of us, we worked hard, but we didn't actually change our capacity to love enough. We didn't work on working out those, those rough places. So it's become my passion to find ways. But I, at last May, I stopped teaching. I was a preschool and kindergarten teacher. I stopped teaching and I started my own business and I've done uh, webinars with the Blessed Family Ministry. But my, my real passion is to take the divine principle with these other tools and two parents words to combine them in together to help us have more tools, not only for our families, but also in educating our, our tribe, our, our physical, our extended family, but also people that we give the marriage blessing to. We need to educate them how to be um, better parents, how to be better husbands and wives. Um, and also, I believe that the best witness that we can give to the marriage blessing that we receive from the two parents is to have a healthy, thriving family. So we, we can kind of work together at the same time of re re um, working on our own relationships within our family as well as reaching out and, and educating and teaching other people how to, how to be more loving. So a great relationship is like a beautiful duet played on instruments, but before learning how to play well together in a duet, we have to, we have to learn how to play the instrument. So it, it takes our effort. Like I started playing the flute. Actually, I started playing the recorder in fourth grade. Everyone in my school did. And then in fifth grade, um, we could choose a band instrument. And I don't think that we sounded very good. You know, probably our parents came to the concerts because they loved us, not because of our great sound. But as we learned to play, then I became, we became a, a better band. In the same way in a relationship, as we, the only way to get better at it is to practice. And relationship is really the heart of the matter. You know, like we can't <coughs> tell it, in, in many ways you can't tell the people, share with them what we think is important to do if they are not knowing that we care about them. You know, if we don't, if they don't feel our heart. So we have to, with, with our children, we have to support their ability to have self-esteem and to, to teach relationship tools in, in our families and in our communities because it's not something we learn in school, it's not a focus, but it's so basic, you know, to, in, in a family, you learn how to get along, how to share, how to cooperate, the essence of teamwork, or we shouldn't do that. Also, just the being present as a, as a family, having family time or meal time, and um, if, there are fa if our children are growing, having um, you know, celebrations centering around something, that a birthday, anniversary, coming together to really appreciate what we have as a family. And then, um, you know, also something that I've been struck with recently in the, the political climate that we have now is so many people don't have the skill to understand how to disagree and still cooperate, still get along, still like each other. That should be taught in the family. That should be part of our work in the family to understand it's okay that, or to find, to work at finding the common ground that we can, that we can agree on. So um, Dr. Michael Hendricks, who used, used to be the pastor in, in um, Colorado Church, now he's, his son is the pastor, his son and his wife are the pastor, but he wrote a book called God Doesn't Want to Be God Anymore. And in the book he talks about how God, God created human children to be an extension of himself, and he want, intended to have us um, be a place where he could dwell and to ex experience the joys and challenges. And he wanted to be able to experience life with us. 
But he said, now most many people's concept about God is like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny come to church twice a year um, and not knowing that God is meant to dwell among us. God is meant to dwell with us in, in our um, relationships within our family. Also, Debbie Gullery, who um, actually worked a lot on the, the Women's Federation presentation, has a book called Smaller Steps to Bigger Love, A Practical Guide to Marriage as a Spiritual um, Practice. And she said that relationship is the most, no, she quotes, a relationship is probably the most powerful spiritual path that exists in the world today. It is the greatest tool that we have. And she also says, how might it be different if we, if we saw our most important great relationships and the actual path to wholeness? What would it happen if we saw marriage and parenting as transformative practices? So if we look at it from that point of view, this is this awesome tool that God gave us to be able to help us grow. It's not, it's not just something that we, parenting isn't something we survive or we endure. It's something to teach us things and help us grow. So we know that also, family as a school of love is an opportunity for us to, to model. Of course we can model things like, you know, brushing your teeth and um, using your, like the bicycle thing, but also we're meant to model right relationships. So we want, as parents, we want to strive to model the kind of behavior that we want our children to inherit. And that includes, as I said yesterday, uh, uh, expressing love to each other, but also showing how we work out problems. Like don't, you know, if we say I'm sorry or we ask for forgiveness in front of our children, then we're modeling the kinds of things that we want um, our children to, to be able to inherit. So even having dinner together, maybe that's not so easy in the, in the younger years, but as they get into being middle schoolers and high schoolers, it's harder. You have to be intentional about finding the time where you meet, where you, you sit together and maybe even have something um, that everybody has a chance to share about, whether it's something you're grateful for or the best thing that happened to me at, at school today or at work today. And, you know, if you have young children now, I, I highly recommend that you institute, a, when, they, when they get cell phones, that you have some rules around cell phones where they don't come to the dining room table. Or, and then as parents, we have to model that. You know, we have to not answer the phone in the middle of, of dinner if we can't help it, you know. Um, so, research shows that kids' greatest sense of security comes when they are confident that their parents love each other. There's been a number of research projects that show the greatest sense of, of children's self security, I'm, I'm okay in the world, comes from the knowledge and the experience that their parents love each other. So when I was doing um, cam camps, sometimes this the sad, like what some of the high schoolers and even young adults would say when I was helping with summer camps, they would say sometimes, I know my parents love each other, but they don't tell me that, or they, or they, and I know that they love me, but they don't say it, they don't express it, you know. So I think we have to err on the side of doing it more, that even at, even when they're adults. If you, if I have an, I had an adult son who was having difficulty with me, who moved out to go to another, um, moved out, he got a job, he went to another um, state. So what I did was, I wrote him a letter every week. Just saying, this is what I'm doing, hope you're doing well. And every week, and I did it for months. And then finally, we, we came a point where we started having um, phone conversations every, once a week or once every two weeks. And I realized, he doesn't want me to tell him what to do. That was the problem, you know. I'm, he's the, my oldest son, and I was too um, intense with him. And I made all the mis we made all the mistakes with him. But, you know, just 
by him, knowing that I cared about him and I wasn't, that I didn't have an agenda. So also as a teacher, and uh, I, I realized that that this isn't the important thing too. That and even Dr. John kept I don't know how to say his name. Kept the Chio. Chio Paul. Chio. Say it again. Cassiopo. Okay. He did a lot of research and he said um, that the absence of love poses a greater risk to our health than smoking. He was looking at mostly um, young children and um, early, early middle, early um, elementary school. And Greg Bear had said in one of his books that we fail to love our children unconditionally only because we didn't receive enough real love for ourselves, usually from childhood, and we can't, so we can't, it's hard to give what we don't have. So we have to find people that, would, that are authentic friends and that we can share our heart with them because we can't expect the love to come from our, our children. We have, to, we have to give that first. <clears throat> And why it's so difficult, you know, it's because we need to realize that when our children, spouses, parents, siblings, co-workers and bosses, friends and other people behave badly, that they're only reacting to the essential needs that they're not receiving. So it, it's not, it, we have to look beneath the surface. We have to recognize that, um, you know, when they're not trying to give us a hard time many times, as I said, you know, sometimes the anger or the Frustration is the first thing, and then the pain is less. So sometimes it's like, it's like this. So that you know, our, what we present to the world is our, our hardened shell, like the shark. But underneath, we're like the little, little goldfish. You know that that, and that's where. And, and oftentimes we don't crack our sh our shell if we don't know if we can trust. So sometimes when. Um, we swim around with our guard up, but what what everybody really wants is to be is to be loved. So isn't it time? Like a shark, like the eye. To me, isn't it? Yep, that's a shark. You want me to go back to that one? <laughs> isn't it time that we really make these relationships and and loving each other a priority? Learning how to love the world has to start in our family and our and our community. And it takes practice. It's like it's like learning a new skill. Like when I started playing my flute, you know, I didn't become great at it, and I made lots of mistakes. So that's another thing we have to be willing to make mistakes and to not um, get defeated by that. So we can't go back and make a new beginning, but we can start today and make a new ending. So we can start today and move forward, regardless of what's happened with, in our relationships, with our families, it, with our adult children. You know, I, I believe, I said this yesterday, that parenting and, and grandparenting is an opportunity to reparent ourselves and to figure out what it is that I need, the ways I need to grow and be a little less crusty, you know, a little more um, open and vulnerable. And so just, just in, I'm going to close now, but I just want to mention that um, I believe that this cornerstone of happiness, which is which we presented yesterday, is a new draft. I mean, it's a draft, so it still has some work to do. But I believe it's it's a way for us to present what we have to offer to the to the world. We know that Jesus came and gave individual salvation, but this is a family level salvation. It's an opportunity. You know, we need the two parents to be able to model and, and, and give us a way to, to go into the next level. And it was just took all these years to get to this point. But the time is now for us to, we, we have something to really um, give to other people and, and recognize that. Of course, we do all that work in the big picture, but also we can't forget the relationships in our families. So. If you're interested, I did put out a couple of my um, my uh, flyers on my website. I have a blog. I do webinars. I have two two um, parent coaching groups right now. One of them is for parents of young children, and one of them, I'm going to start one for parents of adult children. 
And I'm not claiming to be the expert, I'm just the facilitator. I give some content and we'll learn some tools, but the, the point is to build better relationships. So, thank you.